uh, Matthew, I don't know where you're at, dude. I, I've known Matthew for a while now, um, a while, a bit. Uh, Matthew, dude, you, you started as a squirrely freshman, squirrely, tall, but squirrely. Um, and I, I usually, you sit over there. So I'm assuming you're, yes, I found you. Um, you're totally embarrassing, you know, um, in all seriousness, my friend, you've turned into a godly man. You, uh, you take your relationship with Jesus seriously and it, it means a lot to you. So, uh, proud of you. Well done. Uh, hey, um, one fun announcement for you. We are all about bribing people with Chick-fil-A. Like, let's just be honest. It's better than money. Well, okay, sometimes it's better than money. Uh, also, we just want to eat Chick-fil-A. Cindy's shaking her head. She's like, it's not better than money. Um, uh, it, the Bible says don't love money, but it doesn't, it doesn't not say don't love Chick-fil-A. You know what I'm saying? Just get, just gets an option. Um, so, so next week, one of the things that we're going to do is, uh, sorry, in two weeks from now, next week we're doing life groups. In two weeks, we're back in here, but we're going to kind of change our setup a little bit. We're going to do a little bit of a family dinner, like restrictions are changing a little bit for, for us here at the church. And so uh, from 7 to 7.30, uh, we're going to do Chick-fil-A dinner to start our service, which is all of us here. We're going to put tables out and eat, and eat all of that. So uh, if you don't come, like, fine, you didn't want free Chick-fil-A. Uh, now, I just want to warn you, if you're like a multi-sandwich person, right? Like some of you go to Chick-fil-A, you order more than one sandwich. I just want to let you know, we're happy to feed you, but we're not happy to feed your mooching habit. So like, if you're more than one, you need, you need to bring your own two and third sandwich. That was terrible syntax, by the way. Uh, but like, it's fine. I'm gonna give the message. We'll be good. Uh, so you, you need to bring your own second and third. Found it. Uh, sandwiches, but we're, we're just going to do family dinner uh, in two weeks at the beginning of our service, then go through like everything normal. It's just it, like, it just feels fun to do anything together right now. If there's still any concern for you on the distancing and you're, if you're just weirded out by people eating in front of you, there will be space to eat. If you want the Chick-fil-A, but not the people, uh, one, I don't know why you're coming from a group of people, if that's the case, but if you want the Chick-fil-A, not the people, we'll give you, we'll give you uh, a little bit of space with that. Hey, uh, if you got a Bible with you, or if it's on your phone, or if you don't, uh, like just, again, mooching in this case is okay off the person next to you. Turn your Bible to 1 John 4, and you're going to start in verse 7. So turn to 1 John 4 and start in verse 7. Uh, now, now, one of the things that, that is really easy for us to do, or a better way to say there's actually two things that are really easy for us to do, when you and I hear commands... Of, of what is like the right thing to do, uh, especially when we hear them from the Bible and especially when we hear them in church. There, there are two places where it's, where it's really easy for our heart to go. Uh, reaction one is that we hear it and, and then the, the thought in our mind is, oh, I, I got that, right? It's, it's oh no, I, I, I do that. I, oh, I know, I know how to do that. Or, thanks guy from the stage, but I already know that. Especially if you've heard it before, right? Your, your mind can immediately check out or your heart checks out and you're like, okay, cool, man, I got it, move along, right? Where, where's the part of, of the, the talk that applies to me? So that's reaction one. That's one direction our, our heart can go. The second reaction is we can measure what is being asked and then we look at that and go, there's no way I can do that. Are you serious? Or, or we begin to think up reasons in our mind of why what has just been told to us of what we ought to do, we become the exception to that. Or there's something about our circumstance that makes what is being commanded or requested impossible, right? So, so these are kind of the two directions that our heart and mind naturally fall into. And the reason that we do that is that both cases, if we do either one of those, you know what it allows us to do? it allows us to dismiss what's being said. And if I get to dismiss what's being said, I get to do whatever I want. And, and that's where our hearts naturally go, right? I, I just wanna do what I want. And, and so I will either go to the place of going like, yeah, man, I got this already. Or I will go to the place and go, that's too hard. I could never do that. Now, one of the things that that is very, very easy to do with, one of the things that's very, very easy to do with is the command to love other people. It is very easy to go to one of those two places with the command to love other people. Or you're like, man, I've, I've heard this a thousand times. You might even be able to quote verses at me. 
as to uh, how one would do that or, or why they would do that. Or the other thought pops into your head, which is, I get it. I get that that's a command, but certain people or certain circumstances in my life mean that I cannot do that. That is not possible for me to do or simply that I don't, that I don't understand. One of my hopes and, and my goals for tonight is that like truly, and for some of us, honestly, for the very first time, that we would understand what it means to genuinely love other people, that we would understand it and that we would actually grow in our desire and our motivation to do so. That, that for some of us, even for the very first time, that that would become an actual reality in our lives. Now to get there, um, we, uh, we're gonna start in the book of First John. So, so go ahead and uh, go there. I'm gonna read, we're gonna start in verse seven and then we'll get, we'll, uh, we'll get rolling. It says this, it says, Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest. Manifest just means seen among us. That God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation. That word, uh, that word means something else we'll talk about in a second. And he says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Then he finishes in verse 12 and says, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides or lives in us. And his love is perfected. It's, it's shown in us. Uh, as has been said earlier, uh, we're in this series called Belief, where pr pretty honestly, we've been really honest through this series. Said, hey, we, we, we call it that because we, we are after your belief. And the reason that we are after what you believe is because, and this is our series idea, that the kind of the thread that's been running through each week is that what we trust, what you put your belief in, shapes how you live. Or another way to say that is what you really, really believe shows up in what you really do. What you believe is always going to show up in what you do. Another way I could say that is, I can tell what you believe by what you do. It's going to show up. And we have said that, that of all the beliefs that exist, of all the things that, that you need to wrestle with, the one thing that matters more than anything is what you believe about what we call the gospel. What you believe about who Jesus is and what he's done for you and I. And so to give a quick definition, Matthew said it earlier in the video, but so that we're super clear, when we say the gospel, I'm gonna use this word a few times tonight. What I mean is I mean this, the gospel is God's plan. It is the thing he does. And the way he does this is through Jesus. So it is God's plan to save us, you and me, sinners. And not only that, but restore creation, put things back the way they ought to be. And the way he does this is through the life and through the death and through the resurrection of Jesus, his son. That's how that happens. And if you and I are going to live a life that is truly joyful, if you and I are gonna live a life that is truly fulfilling, if you and I are gonna live a life that is in alignment with what God calls good and what God calls true, then where we need to begin is our belief in this claim and what you believe about this claim, because this will affect your life more than anything else. And what we've done is over this series is tried to show how, how the belief and trust in the gospel changes and shapes everything in our life. And what we wanna walk through tonight is how the gospel shapes and changes our ability, our understanding, and actually our motivation to genuinely love other human beings, which, is sometimes easy if we like them, but it's oftentimes hard because it turns out that they're human and you're human and it's often very messy. So what we're gonna to talk to you about, what we're gonna talk about tonight is how the gospel shapes our understanding of love and our ability to truly do that. And from the passage, the very first thing we see is this. 
So let's just start here, right? This is our, start, this is our starting point. Notice in verses seven and eight that John starts by saying that love is defined by God. The, just the concept of love. The expression of love. What love actually looks like, sounds like, feels like, is expressed in life is defined by God. So this is what he says. He says, love comes from God. Love is from God. And the reason that this is true, he goes even further. And then he says, the reason that love even exists as, as something in, in our life is because God is love. And that's an audacious claim, right? He's saying God is the embodiment of love. Like if you want to know what, what love is like, you look at God himself. And, and if God is the one that then defines love, it means that he is the starting point for that. And part of the reason that this is going to be hard or challenge us is because every single one of us, every one of us cannot help but think of the word love and define that by the way that our culture around us does. Like, like we have just been living in that, right? It's, it's natural for us when you hear the, just that, that word love is to begin to think of images and understanding and feelings that are given by the world around us. And what has happened is not only have we bought into that idea of love, I would argue that at times we even defend the world's idea of love, not understanding what we're defending. We're not even understanding that we're defending a definition that is not in alignment with who God is. So let me give examples. Like here's a few things that we're going to hear and I'm immediately going to step in it. So it's going to get great. Um, you ever heard the phrase that, that love is love, right? Love in any context is equal to love in any other context. Now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of meaning behind that phrase, but that's not possible. It is, it is one, an illogical statement, but it is not in alignment. If God is the definer of what love is, not all expressions or claims of love are love. It cannot be. Another phrase, uh, I've, I've heard this said a number of times, uh, is, is that I only allow people into my life who love me. And so then, and so then I create boundaries with like, uh, we love the word toxic, right? It's one of our new favorite words, toxic people. Uh, it's great. I, I'm not sure exactly what it means when people say that, but usually it just means someone that done something bad to them, right? Or even habitually done something bad to them. I'm sure you shouldn't allow someone to abuse you, but it's certainly in that case, I have a little bit of a problem with that issue and say like, I only want people who love me and are not toxic in my life. The problem is at some point you're going to alienate everyone because they're going to treat you badly. Someone at your point, every person in your life is eventually gonna do that. And then the other question I would simply ask is what about your love for them then? If you alienate everyone, what about your love for them? So we've made love this, this moldable and thing or uh, the, the phrase we fell in love, right? We fell in love like, like love is a sinkhole that you both just fell in and can't get out of. Good luck with that, right? Like that love is, a, is a, an accident that I had no control over. But again, we don't use that logic with anything else. Try and use that logic like when you get your license and are pulled over by the cop and you're like, well, oh, just fell into speeding, sorry. Like, like it does, that, that doesn't hold up in life, Right? in any other way, and we use it in that way. Or um, uh, the other night, uh, it, was, it was yesterday, uh, my son, he's eight, he asked if he could watch a show, it was the end of the day. They love dad, but they kind of love TV more. And so they wanted, they wanted to watch something, and I was like, buddy, uh, it's late, we're not, we're not gonna watch anything. And he goes, dad, this is, this is the move, dad, if you love me, you let me watch it. And I'm like, because I love you, we're not, right? So. So he's, now he's joking, mostly, then trying to use love as a manipulative, you know, manipulative tactic. And yet, what is also sad in our culture is people will totally do that, that they will actually sadly and genuinely use the idea of love as, as bait to try and get somebody to do something. And what has happened simply is that we have made love moldable. We have made love something that can mold and shift and change shapes based upon the circumstance or what we want it to be but if God is the definer of love, if he himself is the definition, then love is clear. And love is, is not something that we change the definition of, but we are changed instead by it. And when we say that God is the definer of love, here's what this means. When we're commanded to love other people, 
It doesn't mean just simply doing loving actions on occasion. If God is the definition of love, then he's always that way. God is always that way. He never stops being that way. And so love itself actually becomes a life or a lifestyle. It's it's larger than just simple loving actions that are done between us and another person. It is love that is expressed in everything that we do because that's actually how God is to us all the time. Now, the ultimate example, and John kind of addresses this, and it's in verse, it goes, it goes on in, in verses eight and beyond. The ultimate example of love is shown in what we call the gospel. That's the example of love. If you want to know what love looks like, it looks like Jesus' death and resurrection on our behalf. That God would send his son to people who didn't ask for him, at that point didn't want him, were actively rejecting him. And God would send his son in our place as as the propitiation for our sins. And the word propitiation just means satisfy, that, that Jesus would satisfy what was needed for us to have a right relationship with God. That's what love looks like. If you're wondering what what does love look like? Love looks like the gospel. It it looks like what Jesus did. In fact, John gives it as a definition, right? What does he say? He says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loves us. And he basically, in his own words, expresses what we've just defined defined a few times. So here's what love is, what love looks like based upon the gospel. Genuine love happens even when it isn't returned. Genuine love happens even when it isn't returned. Genuine love is the desire in your heart that someone else's life would flourish regardless of who they are. It's the desire that they would flourish in their life regardless of who they are. Genuine love pursues people even before they realize that they need you to. Genuine love pursues people even before they realize they need you to. And genuine love is the giving of yourself to the benefit of another, even if there's no benefit to you. And genuine love happens before they are worthy of it. And even if they are never worthy of it. What this looks like is is kind of outlined in uh, this this uh, part of a letter that Paul, one of Jesus' followers, writes, and we actually went through it in our last series. That, that in Paul's letter to this church in Corinth, so we call it First Corinthians, in thirteen, Paul defines what love looks like, and he's writing to this church who is doing a terrible job of loving, loving one another. So, so in his definition of love, this is what Paul says. He says, "Love is patient. Love's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no account of wrongs." Love, it takes no pleasure in evil. It rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, oftentimes when we hear this, we hear this as a list of to-dos of what we ought to do in order to love other people. And while that might be an implication, do you know what this list actually is? This list is a description of what God is like to us all the time. He is always this to you all the time because he is love. That's what love is. So for the prideful part of us, as we begin to understand what love is, what this should do is just even a little bit, this should probably scare us a little bit and also humble our hearts to realize that when the command to love one another is given, This is what we're talking about. And there should be this part of us that begins to go, I don't think I can do that. And that is a good place to be. It is a good place to actually be and go like, how how am I supposed to do that, John? How, How am I supposed to be that all the time? Not only just to the people that I like, but also to the people I don't. How is that gonna happen? So it's going to keep us from going to one extreme. So let's keep from going to the other. The second thing we realize in the passage is that love requires the gospel. Love requires the gospel. In order to do this, you need the gospel. So this is going to guard you and protect you from going to that place of going like, sorry, man, 
Thanks for the definition of like how God is all the time. I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. Love requires the gospel. The reason that Jesus came is because we couldn't live up to God's standards. You and I, we can't. On our own, you can't. Including the command to love other people. You cannot live up to that standard on your own. In fact, the inability to live up to that standard proves to us how much we need God to do in us what we cannot do in ourselves through what, what Jesus does on the cross. It proves that we need him to do something in us. And part of the reason that loving others is so hard is because it's not natural to us. Without a relationship with Jesus, loving other people in the the manner that we've just defined, defined by God, is something we cannot do. So this is what I'm gonna suggest. I'm not just gonna say that like without Jesus, loving other people is hard. I'm gonna go even further because this is what the Bible would claim. It's not even just hard. It's actually impossible for you and I to do. Without Jesus, you cannot love people that way something must happen in us that we cannot do in ourselves. Uh, In uh, the book of uh, 1 Timothy, it's what we call 1 Timothy. It's another one of Paul's letters, how naturally human beings, right? That this is the without Jesus us, just kind of what we naturally do. So he just starts listing things. He says, without Jesus, we are naturally boastful. We're arrogant people. We're prideful people. Without him, we're not humble. Um, The other thing that he says is, one of the things he says is we're naturally ungrateful, right? We complain, we're bitter. We, if anything remotely breaks in life, we immediately think it's the biggest deal and we freak out. Uh, my favorite one that he says that like naturally without Jesus we do, he says we're disobedient to parents. Like, which is just like, it's just true, right? That we naturally are not obedient to our parents. Now we're happy to ask them for money, but like we are not naturally obedient to them. But then he goes on and one of the things he lists that is natural to us without Jesus, is he says that we're lovers of self. We put ourselves first. It is our natural disposition as human beings without a relationship with Jesus to just be self-focused first. And this is what Paul points out. He even, or sorry, John points out, he even says, look, an indicator that you have not become a new person made new by what Jesus does is the fact that you are not loving to people. Because clearly you're still living in this old life where you're putting yourself first, you're number one. But listen to what Paul says in second, in, sorry, this is first Corinthians. This is actually second Corinthians. Paul wrote two letters. Uh, the, the first one didn't work. And he's like, oh my gosh, again? So he wrote a second one. It says this, this is second Corinthians five. It says, Christ's love compels us. Like, like one translation says controls. Like I cannot help but respond to it. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we've died to our old life. So there's a transition that happens. The moment that I trust in Jesus' death and resurrection, something happens, including being forgiven of sins, but it is also this, that he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life, one of the implications of that is they no longer live for themselves. So one of the markers of this new life is you're no longer entirely and completely self-focused. And what this means is that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. And part of that new life is now an actual ability. And I would even add the word desire that for the very first time, I can love people as God would call me to. I actually can for the very first time. Now you and I are made in the, in the image of God. So even if you don't believe in God, you can do loving things. But Jesus points out, he says, look, even people who don't believe in God can love people. But for all of us, there becomes a moment where that reaches its limit. And usually that limit is with our enemies. And so Jesus says, I tell you, I tell you to, to do this, which is kind of like, I'm gonna take it further. He says, I tell you even further, love your enemies. And everyone in the audience should have gone, I have no idea how to do that. And that was Jesus' point, that we need Jesus to do something in us so that we actually can love people for the very first time, that he makes it possible. Not only makes it possible, but when he makes us new, that we might actually want to do that with anybody. And there's probably some of you that are, that are in that place tonight, right? Like you've actually been with me all the way up into this point And you said, John, I, I actually want to love people. Like I, I really do. I don't disagree with you. And probably one of the interesting things that you found is how hard it is. 
is hard, right? And, and probably one of the interesting things you've also found is how hard it is to be motivated to do it. It's hard to be motivated to do it. One, life is exhausting sometimes, but also people are. <laughs> it's, right? Like, you chuckling, but there's some truth to that. It's hard. And so the question is, where, where do we find the motivation to do that, right? You, you are made new, so you have a relationship with God, but, like, but you find it to be terribly inconsistent in your life. How, how does that grow to a place where it is consistent and, and mirrors and matches this love that God has for us? And it has to do with our motivation, why we do it, where that comes from. And our motivation for love is the gospel. Love is motivated by the gospel. Or a better way to say this is that the gospel turns love into our motivation, right? The reason we do things becomes love. And keep in mind, I, I'm continually using the definition of love given by God, not the culture around us. So let me ask the question. When it comes to good things that you do in your life, and so let me add in the little, little part, when it comes to good things that you do in your life, and maybe even for God, but especially for God, the things you know you should do, what is your motivating factor for why you do it? Think about it for a second. Why do you do it? Why do you do it? For some of us, the actual motivating factor is fear. You're motivated to be good because you're afraid that if you're not, God is coming after you. You're afraid of that. You're afraid, do the bad thing, then God is either gonna give you a bad thing or take away the good thing. For some of you, maybe it's fear of hell. I, I am afraid of that type of God, so I do good things so he won't be mad. So for some of us, fear is our motivator. For some of us, it's probably duty or obligation, right? You feel duty bound to do it. Like, all right, this is what I gotta do. I'm gonna do it. Or some of us even think that this sounds good, but it's not. We go, well, God did so much for me. God did so much for me and I kind of owe him. I owe him, so, so I'm gonna do stuff for him, including, right, I, I'm with you, John, I'm gonna go love some people. So, uh, so like duty and obligation become your motivation. For some of us, it's just, just you wanna be left alone. Like you do good things to get people off of your trail, <laughs> right? Like may, maybe you are here and you don't believe any of this. And especially maybe you've been here and you've grown up in church and you exist in a church environment and you exist in a church family and maybe you even go to a Christian school and you understand that if you do the things you actually want to do, you're gonna get talked to. So you do good things to get them off the trail so that you can in the end kind of do what you want. Those can be the motivation of why we do those things. But a couple questions with that, or a couple things to consider. Number one, think about that, what, what that means of how you view God, like how you think about God and what he's like. Number two, the thing to realize is how you view God and how you interact with God and what your motivation is between you and God is going to show up in how you interact with people. They will end up being the same, right? So think of what we do. We will do things for people because we're afraid of what they think right? Let's be honest. A lot of our motivation of what we do with and, and for other people is because we are afraid, fear of what they think, or we feel obligated. We have to do this. I don't have the option. I am duty bound to do this. Or we do it because we think we're going to get something in return, right? So, so we have that type of interaction with God, even though maybe we say we believe in him, so naturally then it happens with other people. It, it shows up with other people. But the problem with those motivations is they do not last. They do not stand the test of time and they do not work when you deal with difficult people. That cannot be your motivation to love other people. It cannot simply be just because I'm afraid or you just simply said so, or I'm obliged to, or God did all of this stuff for me. And what the gospel does, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, what it does is it turns love into the motivating factor. God's love for us and what he did for us and our response to that becomes the motivating factor. Here's what I mean. There is no fear between you and God, because of the gospel, there's no fear between you and God because, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you are completely forgiven. There is nothing you have to fear. 
There's no condemnation for you at all, ever, ever, ever. You do not have to fear. And you're not obligated to now like owe God back because your debt is fully paid. That's one of the things that Jesus does. He fully pays the debt. He, he takes everything that we owe, all the sin, everything that we've done, he fully pays the debt. And not only that, on top of that, what then God does is he credits to us, almost like a bank account, he credits everything that Jesus is and does to our account. So all of Jesus' perfection and his holiness and his righteousness, all that is yours. All of it is credited to you. So you're not obligated to do anything. You don't owe him anything. You don't owe him. The concept of that now becomes ridiculous. He gave you everything. And there's even this part of us that's saying, well, if I don't owe him anything and I'm forgiven everything, what keeps me from doing everything that I, and just anything that I want? The answer is love. The answer is what keeps me from doing that is a love for God that I don't just run off and do whatever the heck I want. So the only motivation that is left that lasts, that actually drives us to genuinely love other people is the love that God has for us. It is the only motivation that stands the test of time and actually lasts through difficult people and difficult circumstances and all those things. Paul said this at the end of his chapter on, on love. Notice what he says, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, meaning that this is something that is untouchable, that if this is your motivation to love other people is the love that has been expressed to you, then it stands the test of time. It stands the test of difficult people. It stands the test of the moments where you don't feel like it. When love is the motivating factor to love other people, it lasts, it continues. It goes on. Uh, we, we called this week, if you look at your, your message notes, we called this week, who are we? And the answer is, we are the ones who are loved. John uh, twice in the passage refers to them and us as beloved. That word, it, it just means the loved ones, the ones who are loved. So who are we? We're the ones that are loved by God, not because of our worthiness, but because he is love. And love, love back to him, it, it looks like, it looks like devotion. It looks like affection. It looks like trust. It looks like gratefulness and thankfulness. It, it, it looks like this expression that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13 as we live that with other people. God's devotion to us results in us being devoted to him, which results in us for the very first time actually desiring and being devoted to loving other people regardless of their worthiness of it. Who are we? We are the loved ones who are loved by God that we might love other people. Uh, love is not what you and I have been told. Love is defined by God. Uh, it's defined by who God is, and it's shown in his sacrifice for us. This act of love also changes that for the very first time, because of what Jesus did, you actually can love. It's, it's, you're capable of it now. You don't have to live a life where you're self-centered and thinking of yourself first in all things. But because of the gospel, our, our behavior is free. We're free from being motivated by fear or obligation or, or getting God off of our back. It allows us for the only motivation that lasts and stands the test of difficult circumstances and people in time. And that is the fact that God loves us and we return that by loving others. So where do you go from here? Uh, if you look at the bottom of your message notes, uh, take, take a look. There's three things that I said. And this is how we're gonna close it out is that we admit, ask, and act. That, that first off, uh, just like where do we begin? You begin by admitting based upon the definition of love okay, God, I'm, I'm going to admit that's not me. That's not me naturally. That, that's actually a great place to start. And, and then we're going to ask, like then, then spend time asking, saying, Lord, will, will you help me become that? Or, or will you help me grow in my love for you that it might result in loving people? 
and then act. One of the things that I very intentionally did not do tonight, we said we were after your belief. One of the things I very intentionally did not do is list like 37 ways you can love people. That's great. That's practical. We can work that out in life groups. Because here's the thing I know. I promise you, within five minutes of the amen here, you will have opportunity to love somebody. Like within maybe 30 seconds, it's going to happen. The, the opportunity is going to be constant in our life. And so what do we do? We act upon that opportunity. And when we fail on that, we ask God for forgiveness and help to continue to do so. So this is what we're going to do. We're spend just a, a moment. Will you just kind of take a moment? Uh, we're we're going to pray, if you would, bow your head um, and, and use those three things as your guide. Uh, would you just spend a, a moment between you and God and say, God, I, I admit that this isn't me to whatever extent it is not. And let's be honest, it's not all of us. It's not any of us. Will you spend just a moment and say, Lord, will you help me with this? Will you, will you help me become this person, not out of fear and obligation, but out of love for you or grow my love for you? And then will you ask like, Lord, help, help me in that moment to actually act on it when, it, when the opportunity shows. Take about a minute or so and, and use those three things as your guide. Pray, and then I'm gonna pray for you and we're gonna close this out. Father, I thank you that you are perfectly loving to us in all things. It's who you are. It's what you do. Um, God, I thank you that uh, we do not have to live in fear of you because of what you have done. Or we are not simply obligated to you. Um, and at the same time that we have all the reason in the world to, to live in obedience to you. I pray that for uh, the students that are here tonight that have been living in that, that you would begin to free them of that motivation. God, that for the very first time that they would see that the only reason uh, that they ought to do these things is in love of you. I pray that you uh, just help them, uh, help them be faithful at the first chance they get to, to love other people. Uh, and Lord, I, I pray that you help to remind them of your love for them when they fail at that uh, and give them the willingness and the desire to continue on despite that. I thank you that you are the definer of love and that we have an idea of what it looks like, uh, that it's not moldable, uh, that it is not changing, uh, because that means that your love for us is not changing despite how terrible we were that day. I thank you that your love for us is constant and consistent. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.